Kubernetes came out of uh, a, a project called Borg at Google. Um, all the all the like the Kubernetes founders have since, or well, all the Borg founders kind of moved on from Google, and they've they've gone to various other companies. But um, you know the really the thing that created Kubernetes was Google's Borg project, and there's there's a really good write up on what it is if you if you just Google if you just Google Google Borg. Uh, you'll you'll kind of see um, where this kind of came in. So on the left hand side is uh, Google Board, and on the Borg on the right hand side you see Kubernetes. Um, the idea behind Borg was to kind of uh, provide a, an API for a, a large number of um, for machines out there. You can you can totally have hardware devices on your network that are connected to a uh, Kubernetes platform. You can, I mean, the majority of what you see today is, is virtual machines. But uh, on the left-hand side, you see, obviously, there's like, at the top level there, a configuration side of it, various command line tools and web browsers that configure the, uh, the Borg thing. Um, they they had a scheduling component inside of what they were calling a cell, a cell being a, a cluster for Kubernetes. Um, and then the Borg master, you know, you could have multiple Borg masters there. Um, they would, you know, ha share some sort of persistent store between each other. Uh, later in life under Kubernetes, that became etcd. Uh, at least that's my understanding. And then ultimately, they all communicated with these Borglets. And the Borglets in Kubernetes world are the Kublets. And those are just little, um, little utilities running, little, little API servers running on each of the different nodes that are communicating back with the master to say, hey, here's, my, here's who I am. Here's the amount of resources I have available. Um, in some cases, you know, you want you want to kind of taint, uh, or not taint, but you know, the taint allows you you can you can set it up so you like don't run on this node, run on this node instead. Um, you can you can set up different flags for a node to say, hey, this node has a GPU. If you need a pod, and I'll get into what a pod is in a second here. If you if you if you need a pod that needs a GPU, it's got to run on this node instead of this node. So you can kind of control which things, which workloads run on which uh, servers that way. So that's that's pretty interesting. On the right hand side, you see the Kubernetes architecture there. Um, we'll kind of get into that in a second. But you know, it's kind of like Borg. There's a command line utility. There are user interface uh, utilities. I don't necessarily use the interface, the UI, too much. I can show it today. Um, it's kind of like a. I feel like it's like a, a an anti pattern to Kubernetes to use that API. There's there's copious amounts of other mechanisms to to do that. But ultimately, um, the master is provided by this control plane. Um, and you have some of the same things there, an API server, schedulers, controller managers, and then all that persistent store inside of etcd, talking to various workers that can run different containers. They all have the underlying uh, Docker uh, virtualization plane there. And then the kubelet is communicating with the master to say, here's what I'm running, here's what I can do. You actually don't just have to use Docker for that. There's a lot of different mechanisms you can actually run uh, can, for containerization, and it will uh, it, it'll, it'll it'll provide it for you. One thing to mention here. Um, give me one second. I uh, I've gotten a message from somebody that's saying that they're having an issue getting to the to the thing here. One second. So Patrick, while you're looking that up. One interesting thing too is that Google. Does, All right. Um, so, you guys hear me? Uh, any questions so far? Yeah. Can you hear me? And can you guys hear me? Hopefully, everybody can hear me, and I'm not just talking to myself. Can you guys hear me? Uh, maybe. Hello. I can hear. I can hear everybody. Perfect. All right. 
Right, Patrick, can you hear so, me? Uh, the control plane components, this is a boring slide, but I, I need to at least explain it a little bit. I promise this will be very demo heavy. I, I prefer demos over slides, so it'll be it'll be good. Um, the first control plane component is really that API server that is being provided, really the idea there being like a, a developer or an admin or whoever um, has the ability to use tools or a UI or I mean, you could, if you could authenticate properly, you could use curl to interact with Kubernetes. Like there's so many ways to interact with Kubernetes because ultimately like everything is exposed via the API server. Uh, the API server is a component of the Kubernetes control plane that exposes the Kubernetes API. The API server is the front end for the Kubernetes control plane. So like um, you'll see in some of the commands I run later, um, there's lots of different ways to display the data, but you know the, the pretty simplest way is to display it via JSON, and it, and it comes back that way. So it's pretty cool. Um, really, the key to Kubernetes is everything has an API, and it's a published spec for the API. It just it's always out there. It's always available as long as the API server. Is running. If the API server is running, um, things will continue to run. Uh, they just, you can't make any modifications to it. Um, CD is the consistent, highly available key value store in Kubernetes backing uh, basically all the cluster data. So any sort of configuration that you put out there, uh, it gets stored in etcd and, you know, however you want to redundantly store that etcd data is, is what you do. So like you can have multi-masters that uh, use something, I think, like Zookeeper to kind of keep the data kind of going back and forth uh, to keep it all in, in check. Um, I, I think that's how that works. The, you know, the mechanism that we use uh, for, for the company I'm at is we just take backups of etcd pretty regularly. Um, and we actually use, like, uh, what is it, Amazon's EBS to uh, provide the data store for etcd's data store like to provide like the actual storage of it so as long as uh as, as long as ebs is available to the node then etcd is available and it just we won't lose any data um <coughs> another component is the coop scheduler the control plane component that watches for newly created pods with really uh no just assigned node there and selects a node for them to run on so um like I said earlier, you know, you can set some flags to say, okay, this node uh, has a GPU that this workload needs to use, or this node, or th this this pod needs, you know, X number of gigabytes of memory to, to run properly. The kube scheduler is the thing that's looking at everything saying, okay, this, this needs to actually have this here, this needs to have that there. Um, and that's that's ultimately like what actually schedules all the different things there. Your question? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Cool. So yeah, my mic wasn't working for the reason, but I just wanted to say earlier on that um, Google did donate. My understanding is they donated code to the Linux kernel around control groups and um, namespaces in the mid 2000s. It wasn't openly talked about, but it was directly to support Borg or some of their efforts with Borg. So. They were making some contributions to the Linux kernels. They were using Borg internally. They just kept the name Borg and their efforts under wraps until later on when they, when they actually made Kubernetes public. Interesting. Uh, another component there is uh, the Kube controller manager, uh, the control plane component that runs controller processes. Um, each controller, like you look at it as like a, a separate process. Uh, you want to hope that it kind of reduces complexity, but uh, it, it kind of, uh, different types of controllers that are out there is like the node controller, job controllers, any sort of endpoint controllers. We'll get into services and pods here in a second. Um, it's also different like uh, authentication types of, you know, you want to have a, some sort of service account or or tokens that get passed out there, there's controllers for that as well. All that gets managed via the Kube controller manager for the various components. Any questions? 
I just wanted to say one other piece of the architecture that I find interesting is most items will talk through the API server. The only thing actually changing at CD, my understanding, is the API server. So no one else yeah. makes changes to CD. And the way this Correct. works is there's events and event loads. So this allows you to very easily write your own scheduler. The scheduler is just getting notified via the API server that a pod was created or somebody wants to create something. And it'll ask the API server, well, what nodes are available? The API server will tell it. And it'll just determine where best to run the pod. Send that inform information to the API server, which updates etcd, but then it's done. And then API server will notify a kubelet, hey, you got to run a pod. And the kubelet will then pull the information it needs and, and launch the pod. So it's very easy to plug in your own pieces here. If you just subscribe to the same events and respond to the events in an appropriate way, you can write your own schedule. Like it's 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 really uh, trivial to do a lot of that stuff. He says that. Uh, <laughs> however, I am a fan of using the built-in schedulers because they work fantastically. <laughs> On the node side, you know, like like you saw there, there's there's a couple of different components. You know, the the kubelet is just the agent that runs on each node. That's the word I was looking for, agent. Uh, it runs on each node in the cluster, and just you know, make sure the containers are running in that pod. You'll uh, you'll see in the demo later. I should be able to show um, some of the different uh, the, the different configurations of of some of these different uh, things that like when I when I show uh, I'm gonna show a working environment that we use um, and in some of our pods we have eight or nine different uh, containers that are that are just doing various things to kind of like be steps along the way to provide the actual service for that thing um, and so you know all of those uh, all those are really just orchestrated by the kubelet that's getting commands from the the different controllers we were just talking about uh, the kube proxy is, is really just like, uh, depends on how it's set up, but um, it, it's just the network proxy that runs on each node in your cluster and implements part of the Kubernetes services. Um, there's there's lots of different networking providers. I think uh, that we end up using is Flannel. There's there's a lot of like Amazon kind of has their own. You can, you can do, uh, um, you, I forget the name of it. Uh, but there, it was a really odd one to me. It was um, I forget the I forget the name off the top of my head. But it was instead of like flannel, will kind of do all the networking within Kubernetes. The the other um, networking component that's provided when you if you run inside of an AWS environment actually does all the networking for the Kubernetes cluster via VPC routes. And so you have to be careful because it'll you can run out of uh, entries into that into that VPC uh, the, the the routing table there, and at the same time, um, actually delayed the the deployment of our cluster by a little bit because you would make it would make these API calls to set up the the routing inside of the VPC, but it would take like five minutes longer for all those routes to propagate through that VPC. Whereas using Flannel, it's all happening inside of Kubernetes. Obviously, various reasons you would use those for different things, and in our case, we were using that other uh, networking layer uh, because it was the only one at the time supported by GovCloud, and we were trying to get our FedRAMP certification. Since then, Flannel now supports GovCloud, and, and it works fine. But uh, lastly, the container runtime is just the runtime that the software. Is, is running the container. So a lot of times you see uh, Docker, I think Core, S, Core OS is still supported out there. Um, there's just a lot of different runtimes. And as, as long as that runtime is supported by Kubernetes, it should work perfectly fine. Any questions? Yeah, this is easy. Yeah, there's a lot of different runtimes. There's container D. I, I think the most common one is now. It, it, they do change. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's well. I, I don't actually know. I'm. I would gather it's Docker just because Docker still, uh, kind of, for a, at least a while has controlled that market. But they're they're doing a fantastic job of 
losing their market share. So who knows what it is? Let's do a Google. What's the most popular, most popular container run time in Kubernetes? Just trying to see if like there's like a somebody just comes out and says, oh, it's this one. <laughs> Container D, CRIO, and then Docker. I don't know that it's in any order, but yeah. Times. All right. Um yeah, so let me let me just kind of demonstrate some of this stuff here. So Patrick, I dropped give... I dropped a link in the uh, chat that there's a there's an open shift course, but it's really low level what's going on with containers if you want to drill into that and how they're created, how space is allocated for them, what they actually look like, process with processes within Linux. So it's pretty comprehensive, but it's pretty low level too. Can everybody see my uh, screen here or do I need to zoom in? Could you make the text larger? It's pretty good. All right. So I'm on a Mac, don't hate me. Um, I use uh, Docker Desktop. It has a built-in uh, Kubernetes uh, device. Kubernetes cluster is just built in. Um, there are other other ones out there, another popular one is called Minikube. Uh, but ultimately, the idea there is just a local environment that provides Kubernetes. I, I, actually, another good one is called K3S. Uh, so K8S is just Kubernetes, but replacing all of the, the, the letters inside of uh, Kubernetes to just call it K, K8S, Kates. Uh, there was an organization that uh, did a play on that call and created a single node Kubernetes called K3S. Again, Minikube is another single node. And then Docker Desktop, if you do something like Kget nodes, you'll see there is a single node here that's been running for 24 days. That's not true because I just restarted it, but it's it's 24 days old. Um, you can kind of, you can get a whole bunch of stuff. We can do uh, scribe node, Docker Desktop, we can see all the information about it. There's a lot of good pieces of information in here. That, like I was saying, you know, there's a lot of. It'll tell you how many pods it can run, how how much CPU and memory is available. This is all pieces of information that Kubernetes kind of uses to to properly schedule this stuff. It'll tell you, you know, you've got some stuff already running out there. These are all related Kubernetes things that kind of keep it just. You know, running properly. Some of these, like the VPN con kit controller, that's there probably because of re requirement for Docker Desktop. Um, same as like the storage provisioner. These are all things that I don't necessarily know like the ins and outs of. It's just part of the system to keep Kubernetes running for this particular uh, deployment. Um, like I was saying, there's there's also uh, all of this is available in kind of different formats. So we can do a git node uh, of that Docker desktop. And instead of getting it in this like text view here, we can get it in JSON format. And then my favorite tool that we were talking about last time, you could pass it through JQ to kind of make it a little prettier. Um, and it, it all depends on how you want to interact with it. Nobody. Uh, I don't know that anybody has a particular way in which they want to look at it. It all really depends, truthfully. Like there's a there's a million different ways to do it, and you know if you're if you're more if you're more JSON friendly, like this is the view you use. If you're wanted in, I don't even know what other formats there are, but you could take a you could take a look. Oh, here we go. Um, See what one of these other ones here look like. Here's a YAML format. So like just like in JSON, you can get it in YAML. It's pretty interesting. 
obviously it has a hard time kind of displaying some of this. It's okay. So same goes for, you know, so the different types that are out there, you get your nodes, you can get uh, pods. We're not actually going to see anything in this namespace. So there's, there's uh, like Rich was saying, there's a bunch of different uh, namespaces, just like you would with uh, the C groups and whatnot. Uh, for for an actual node, you can you can get all the different ones out there. So Kube system is kind of just the namespace that Kubernetes uses for all of the activities that it's doing. If we were to say like, hey, we want to finally run something here, let's take a look at. Um, we can we can do a couple of different things. Like let's let's just take a look at a very basic uh, deployment. And really, a deployment is kind of like a depends on how you actually uh, configure it. But in this case, I'm just going to do a very de simple deployment here um, where I'm, I'm not even really specifying anything crazy inside of this deployment aside from this uh, this image that we're passing in. And that deployment, you can you can specify a bunch of different things, but ultimately in this deployment, we're just really specifying to create a uh, an actual pod that's just running this image here. So now I can do okay, get pods in the default namespace, and it shows me that this node has started running. So let's take a look at the pod here. And we see that um, you know it's in the default namespace. Uh, it jumped on the single node that we had. We see it started a little bit ago. There's some labels in here. These labels, when you get into more, uh, more in-depth deployments, labels labels become a very important thing. Um, this actually, this label here. So you see how I did this kget pods hello node. Like I had to, I had to first get kget pods like this. And then I got the describe pod and I described the name there. I can instead do something like describe pods um, dash L and something like that. And that should do the same thing. The same kind of can go if I were to like do something like K logs dash F, I can do that. And it should, if there's any, there might not be any logs yet. Um, I can do the same for something like this. This comes in handy if you end up having multiple of the same, uh, multiple instantiations, multiple um, replicas is the word I'm looking for. So we can we can kind of talk about it in a little bit. If you have multiple uh, replicas of something to kind of for like load balancing or or just to work through a lot of data, um, if you have hundreds of nodes, you may have hundreds of these pods out there and what what ends up getting really helpful is if you use something like that instead of typing in that whole pod name you can assume that this is going to change every single time for all the different pods that are out there we do something like this and it'll give us the logs for all of the different ones that are tagged with that app hello node so that that comes in handy for for much larger deployments um, we see a status of running, there's some IP information. These are all like local IPs on it. Um, deployments use these replica sets. Like I said, we can actually do something like, uh, if we want, we could probably do a K, um, scale deployment. You don't always have to type the whole thing out. So you can do like K scale deploy, hello node. Replicates two. I should be able to k get pods now, and we see we just started another one. And so when we start looking at what I'll do here in a second is create a service that should create like an internal load balancer. Um, when I hit that service, it will actually load balance between the two there, which is kind of cool. Um, actually, this is this kind of helps us if we. We look at the events now. We should see that um, you see all the testing I was doing earlier. That's that's fine. We don't need to worry about that just now. So let's create that service. So 
we want to expose the deployment hello node uh, type called a load balancer um, Kubernetes kind of has some of this stuff already built in for a lot of this, which is kind of nice. In other cases, you might want to, instead of using the Kubernetes built-in activities, you can you can use something like a, like Nginx has their has a built-in controller for some of this stuff. Um, in AWS, if you use like the AWS provisioner and you say load balancer, it'll actually go out to AWS as long as you pass it the correct permissions. Uh, it'll go out into AWS world and create a load balancer and properly set it up to the nodes, which is kind of cool because now you're kind of offloading the load balancing capability to something else and you're not like using up your cluster resources for that load balancing. So, oh, of course I already created that. Let me, <laughs> uh, all right, let me create it again now. Right, so now we can get services and we can see that there's this hello node load balancer. This cluster IP, that's just like internal to itself. We know because this is a single node. In this case, our external IP is this. When uh, when I show like a, an actual Kubernetes production environment, you'll see external IP. It may not be called external IP, it might be called uh, uh, it might be called external IP, but ultimately it'll it'll probably be the the C name of the AWS load balancer in that case. Um, so in this case, I should be able to take this local host here on port 8080, and I curl that endpoint, and we see it. Let's go ahead and see the both these pods K logs dash f uh, l app hello node so now let's look at that logs there and now we should be able to do something like this again do it a couple of times and we should see there's all of my uh curls that i've done so essentially what i'm doing here is i'm looking at the logs for the hello node and we've exposed that hello node via localhost port 8080 and it responds back here with the super awesome information that we wanted it to uh, for this very simple hello node thing. And we see the logs that are that are happening there. Does that all make sense to folks? Any any questions there? Is that good? Is this is this helpful? Is this is this too boring? Tell me, and, and I can I can crank it up a little bit on the on the exciting factor. Maybe I'm talking to myself, and that's fine too. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So there's just a lot to Kubernetes. I I, I think yeah. it's it's really challenging to sort of cover it quickly, and then. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of different providers, whether it's Amazon or Azure or Google or, you know, Red Hat with Shift, do fill in gaps. So where there's holes in what Kubernetes provides or missing functionality, they do make selections of choices for you. So you'll get things like storage capabilities or what you mentioned around networking and all these different things where, you know, Kube may not have a full solution. And there's an interesting chart, Patrick. I don't know if you could bring up your browser. I dropped it into the chat, the landscape. Cloud Native Compute Foundation IO website. And it just shows you like all the open source projects that are out there for different aspects of a full solution. So, so different providers are making choices on what the technology is in the stack. And a lot of them are the same, but you know, sometimes there's differences. So if you go with the uh, Amazon Kubernetes as an example, or Azure or Google or, or even Red Hat, you're gonna have those choices incorporated into what you're doing. So Folks can start with vanilla Kubernetes. It, it's a lot of work to fill in those gaps. And then once you've filled in those gaps, you have to, I guess, maintain all that going long term. So all these individual projects, if you look at that landscape slide, they have, you know, they all on their own individual development cycle. They change over time. So you, you'd have to like manage all of that if you want to just go pure K8S. So yeah. Um One of the one of the things that actually kind of helped me 
understand things a little bit better was to use um, obviously kubectl helps a little bit um, being able to have things like uh, user interface do kind of help uh, there's a lot of different ones out there to kind of help display it I use lens l-e-n-s um, you can kind of see all the different Kubernetes clusters I talk to on a given day uh, but in this case here you can see you know you can see node information. We can actually even hear uh, if we needed to. I don't know that it'll let me actually uh, connect to the node. Maybe this might not, but in the other, hey, look at that. Yeah, so we can do stuff like pop and uh, see how much space left. Not that you would ever actually have to do this stuff. Um, it helps. Uh, just to verify things are working properly, just to have the 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 node access there. What's kind of interesting there is, it will when you do something like that, it should. Um, I don't know that it actually did when I just did it, but it, it what it's doing is it's actually for that uh, connecting to the node there. It's actually running a deployment of this thing called like node shell and so it's not actually sshing to the environment it's running a kubernetes pod that has some elevated privileges on the node so it's it's using kubernetes to administrate kubernetes which is really uh i think um exhibit ish of the yo dog, I heard you like Kubernetes, so I put Kubernetes in your Kubernetes. Uh, I've always found that to be kind of interesting of uh, being able to use Kubernetes to administrate Kubernetes is pretty interesting. Um, as we kind of look at this, you know, we can see that there's these different deployments. But like I said, here's all the different namespaces that are out there. We're, we're kind of you really primarily only use either a default namespace or um, in some of your more production workloads, you'll have a lot of other different namespaces. Uh, but you can see some of the same pieces of information that we were seeing before of the different labels and all that. In this case, we've got a replica set of two. I could go in here in this and actually, you know, add a bunch of nodes here. And you can see them going through creating them getting them spun up and probably see some issues of them not actually running. Maybe because we hit some sort of limit. That's probably what the issue is there. It's only letting us run two. Actually, we could probably see the events and see why it wouldn't let us run that. 20 seconds ago, started. And it's actually, so I guess the limitation in Docker desktop is the amount of resources available, it actually wouldn't let me start those um, start those pods, which I find kind of interesting. You can kind of see why it wouldn't. But that's fine. We can we can actually look at one of the more uh, impressive clusters out there that I have. Um, so here's a. Don't mind the the failures on here because I actually cleared out my kube config so I wouldn't actually pull it up. Let me let me actually try double check that I actually have the right um, let me clean these up. Hold on. I should have should have cleaned these up earlier, but I will get them working here in a second. I wish there was a quicker way to clean these up. That's okay. So one of the one of the ways in which you interact with Kubernetes, well, the only way you really interact with Kubernetes is via uh, a config file. That, that config file, I can actually show it shortly. Um, Here we go. Okie dokie. Let's see if I get this working right. 
that's not happy about that. I'm trying to remember the actual. I wonder if I actually never on this version connected to one of our environments. This might not be a good demo for this. Okay, let me let me actually just show it inside of kubectl instead. Should be able to switch over to, yeah. Perfect. All right. So in this case, I can do something like k get pods now. And uh, we see hundreds of difference of pods going on for Iron Defense. And this, this actually probably is best displayed right now um, with this little view here. So this is uh, this isn't me trying to like market for IronNet. I just this is this is a production Kubernetes environment. So it's it's probably a better uh, visual than the uh, in the Docker desktop single node Kubernetes. So this is our production deployment of, of Kubernetes. We have multi availability zone capability. So, you know, those different auto scaling groups down there and have uh, different nodes and different availability zones so that if one node goes down or one availability goes zone goes down, the other nodes can scale up and, and process the data. Um, normally, we only have like a single master. We do have multi master capability, uh, but you know, it's, it's just providing the API server and the scheduler. And then we have various nodes here um, in our Let's see if we look uh, at Patrick, you see that yeah can you zoom in please please uh let me see a little bit. is that helpful slightly how about that it's a little bit better yeah thank you yeah um actually let me actually zoom in on the Can I does that help? Nope. That does not help. All right, let's do this instead. Let's pull up image. This will be better. You'll like this. All right. And there we go. Okie dokie. So um, kind of the way we have, like I said, we have it again. Yeah, perfect. That's my, awesome. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, like this load balancer is for kubectl commands. That's that, that command line utility I was talking about before. That's that uh, API that Kubernetes provides. We put it behind a load balancer in AWS and it's, uh, it's just serving out uh, data from the master. We have another load balancer that's presented by uh, the service stuff I was showing earlier um, for all of our different uh, endpoints that we provide. That's all controlled via single load balancer in AWS, but it it interfaces with the uh, Nginx load balancer to properly forward stuff the different services and in Kubernetes it's seen as as different services we'll get there in a second but ultimately you'll see um, what's really cool about it is it's a single load balancer and so AWS is handling all of that um, and it's able to handle whatever amount of data that's being sent through it um, but it's also then breaking up that data to the different services and interact and the user interacts with the data on those different services as if it's a different load balancer, but it's we're only getting charged for a single load balancer there. Ultimately, at some point, we were actually thinking we could actually put the Kubernetes API on the same load balancer as those other APIs, but we kind of wanted an administratively separated out uh, load balancer there. Um, Iron Defense itself is pretty heavy on uh, 
on doing like analytics things. Um, so we actually use, uh, we, we spin up our own uh, set of nodes every hour. And um, when they come online, we have a, a, our own scheduler, just like uh, what Rich was saying was a, you can build a scheduler fairly easy. Um, we have our own scheduler that comes online when it sees those nodes and starts scheduling uh, analytics to run. Uh, what's super cool about that is, you know, it's 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 its own little automated thing. There, we we kind of spin up the the pods as as needed, and um, kind of just run run the run the analytics over the data as it comes in. Is there a question there? Yeah. So so this this answers a question I think for me. I was I was curious why you didn't go with like AKS or something on Amazon, but it sounds like you wanted the customization and more control over your cluster. We're, we're actually uh, in the process of migrating to EKS for our deployments. Um, right now we use a thing called uh, COPS, Kubernetes Operations, and that's what actually deploys our Kubernetes clusters currently. But we're actually, we're actually in the process of moving over to uh, EKS, the Elastic Kubernetes Service. Okay. And will they let you put your own scheduler in when you use EKS? Well, so probably what's going to happen when we do that is we're actually potentially moving away from Spark on Kubernetes and, and using some other uh, analytic orchestration things. Um, it's all still up in the air. I don't necessarily know all the plans there. And then I guess from an Amazon perspective, did your usage bills go down when you, when you containerized and ran a lot of stuff as your analytics jobs as containers? Um, yeah, because we were originally using uh, Elastic MapReduce service, and that uh, puts on a additional like twenty cent charge uh, per cluster. Um, and so when we moved to that, we instantly per hour per cluster were twenty cents cheaper. The same amount of CPU resources, just minus the EMR uh, master. And then do you guys do anything on-prem with like, do you get the snowballs or anything like that or not really? We, we, haven't, we haven't used any like of the, the snow family. Um, we are in the process of actually doing some uh, on-prem stuff with Nutanix, which has a built-in uh, Kubernetes cluster um, that we're leveraging for that. And I think um, that was updated to actually do Spark on Kubernetes as well through Nutanix. You mean the carbon stuff they had? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that fixed IP node that's there, that's actually pretty interesting because depending on like how customers get set up, um, interestingly enough, a lot of folks still can only um, write list IP addresses instead of like whole domain names. So we couldn't present to them a uh, URL for them to have our sensor send data to. So they still have to send to an IP address. And so what we did there is part of the way we set that cluster up, we give it a, uh, a fixed IP address that it always will have, um, no matter what that node is. It's still an auto scaling group, but as that, uh, if that node goes down, a new node comes up and it gets the, the IP address again. Um, because we always want that IP address to be the same for the customer. And that's not necessarily a load balanced. Uh, it's not load balanced. We do want to get it load balanced someday just to kind of make it a little bit easier. Um, but it, it's actually exposing those services on the IP address to, for that customer, which is kind of cool. Um, and then the last couple of workloads we have down there is our, like our database stuff with Citus and then Kafka kind of just passing all the traffic around. Those are all services inside of Kubernetes um, provided you know, that everything's working right. It, it just works, which is pretty cool. Um, I can kind of show here um, the, the pretty detailed environment. Give me one second. So like you saw all the different pods which is pretty crazy if we do like uh, okay, get services. We'll see all the different services we're presenting. Here's that 
load balancer I was talking about. So there's, um, we, we could probably do one like, can you get services grep for load balancer? That was a horrible um, uh, demonstration there. Give me one second. Let's do all namespaces. There we go. So you can see that the uh, Grafana is on a different uh, load balancer than the uh, ingress controller there. Uh, that ingress controller, if we do something like a K git ingress, you'll see that it will present on all those different IPs or different URLs there that it'll listen on, but they're all the same load balancer. So uh, we could do, we can actually get something like, uh, if we do just like this, you'll see it responds. It's just, that's just telling it that it re, to redirect it to, uh, if I had to guess, I think what that's redirect tells it to redirect to, um, yeah, it just tells it to redirect to this. So we can do something like that and it'll it says it's all our application says, you know, it's an curls an incompatible browser. That's fine. Um, we want to look at iron mod. Actually we want to. Yeah, so like we can hit all these different endpoints. They're all provided by the same ingress controller. That ingress is really just that controller that we were talking about before uh, but it's it's just redirecting it's it's handling the traffic from that individual load balancer that's handling all those different endpoints there that we we listen on um, there's aside from that you know it's, it's really just the running of all these different services inside of the cluster like there's it's this is what provides our our actual kubernetes service like this whole thing here um it's really just the or kubernetes really what it comes down to is kubernetes is the orchestration behind making all of this become our our product that we sell same for anybody truthfully that would be running kubernetes here's some uh here's that additional replication sets so that we were talking about so like I can, I can instead of looking at the logs of that pod by itself, I can do something like threat and see the logs for both of them at the same time. And so that's outputting the logs from both of those pods right now. It's just doing whatever it's doing. I don't necessarily know off the top of my head what the threat service does, but it's it's doing stuff. It looks like it's right now to telegraph. That that I do know. Same can be said if we were to look at. I don't know if we have any analytics jobs running yet. There were some earlier. We can look at Zookeeper logs. The only reason I'm I'm typing in the app there. I, I just I know off the top of my head what that app is called. So like normally you would describe the pod to kind of figure out what the app label is. It doesn't have to be an app label. It can be, you know, it can be a whatever you want to call the label. You could call it a, a chicken label, you know, or a, I don't know, anything. It just depends. That's it's really Kubernetes in a nutshell is just providing an API of, of different services. That's about it. Is that helpful to anybody? It's all very interesting. Thank you. There's there's a million different ways to do it. There's uh there's that Rich and I were talking about EKS. Um, OpenShift is Red Hat's 
uh, instantiation of it. They they have a managed service uh, with OpenShift that provides Kubernetes. A lot of different mm-hmm. things actually with OpenShift. Is it OpenShift that provides Kubernetes or? Yeah, so so it's built on top of Kubernetes. If you want to share your screen again and bring up the landscape.cncf.io, there's just a ton of projects out there for cncf.io. And that should bring up this massive diagram. But under the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, there's tons and tons of um, projects that support things like metrics collection, logging, you know, diff- different aspects of a Kubernetes solution that aren't um, embodied in Kubernetes itself. So to get a complete solution like Patrick was doing, you can use EKS if you're running on Amazon, and that's like the platform of choice. Azure has their Azure Kubernetes services. I forget what they're doing. OpenShift is also available as a... Yeah, try a, try landscape.cncf.io, and I think that's... The, their, cncf.io that should just be the the website without the area so here's all of the projects that exist under various headings so if you're building a comprehensive solution where you want logging and metrics you want um, metrics or uh, other capabilities you know more flexibility on networking things like that you can pick and choose from here and incorporate it into kubernetes and it will work but then you're taking on the management of all of that going forward over time as these things individually evolve separate from each other. So the nice thing about solutions like EKS or OpenShift or Azure solution is that's all pre-baked for you. So so they give you more comprehensive capability than what comes with just vanilla Kubernetes. And then OpenShift's big pitch is it's portable. So if you run OpenShift on Amazon, it's the same OpenShift on Azure or wherever else. So you, you can make your workloads independent of the clouds. So so it's really it, it's really like a choice on, you know, I, I think IronNet has invested heavily in Amazon. That's sort of like your home. So so the likelihood of you guys moving to Azure or something else is probably very low. And and there's not a big exfiltration cost if you want to take your data somewhere else. Like you're you're really not gonna look at that or at least not in the, the immediate future. But for folks that want that portability or even bringing stuff on prem, then you got to look at these other solutions that give you some choice and, and run in multiple locations. But that, that's basically it in a nutshell. I think that OpenShift makes some choices for you. EKS makes choices for you. Azure makes choices for you. And, and you just got to, you know, live with it, with the abstraction that's that's where you want to focus. So if your organization wants to really dig into the weeds and, and drill into Kubernetes and, you know, get familiar with all of these different components, then, you know, that's that's something you can certainly do. And it, and it certainly enables it. Um, a lot of folks we talk to, they just want to build apps. They don't want to really get into super deep and all these stuff under the hood. They just want a logging solution that works or a metric solution that works. So, Yeah, there's quite a bit of them. And those are the various platforms that are out there. And then on the left-hand side, there's technologies too. Like, So you can just start walking through technologies. You want service mesh. You want you know, networking. You want key management. Like, You can start picking and choosing stuff to incorporate into your solution.